Anionic polymerization is a kind of addition polymerization where the reactive chain end contains an anion. And like the cationic polymerization case, there's a two-stage mechanism here involving an initiator reacting first, followed by the chain lengthening or propagation stage. So the initiator here is typically a Bronsted or Lewis base. And reaction of that Bronsted or Lewis base with a monomer molecule creates an anion, Rm- in the initiation stage. Now that anion can react with neutral mo uh, monomer molecules repeatedly to lengthen the chain, and we always have a negative charge on the chain end. That's the hallmark of ani anionic polymerization. Like cationic polymerizations, anionic polymerizations can also be living in the sense that if the anion hangs around for a long enough time and is stable enough, we can just add more monomer if we want to lengthen the chain over where we are at any particular point in time because there's still reactive anion in there that will consume added monomer as monomer is added. That's the hallmark of a living polymerization. Now, how this actually manifests itself typically involves, again, a CC double bond or sometimes anion stabilizing atoms like nitrogen and oxygen with negative charge. So here's an example of an anionic alkene polymerization with butyl anion as an initiator. Butyl anion has added to the alkene in the first step, creating this anion. This anion can add to the alkene, creating a new anion, and this happens over and over and over and over again. We can think of it as a nucleophilic addition of the anion to the CC pi bond. And notice we end up with a negative charge on the reactive chain end. That's the hallmark of anionic polymerization. Now, we can get a little clever with anionic polymerizations because there are multiple ways to create an anion. For example, we can think about a leaving group that's taken a pair of electrons with it as forming an anion. And that's what's going on in the second case here, where initiation involved deprotonating this um, cyclic amide or, or lactam to create this anion. This anion can add to a neutral molecule of lactam repeatedly and this results in ring opening in the formation of a free N minus. So this is a good opportunity to pause and make sure you understand what's going on here. There's a two-stage mechanism involving nucleophilic addition first, followed by beta elimination of NH minus, and this is what leads to this free N minus, which is now capable of adding another neutral molecule of lactam and lengthening the polymer chain. These kinds of ring opening polymerizations under anionic conditions are commonly used. It's a convenient way to kind of package up the monomer, right, in a cyclic form and only open it when polymerization occurs. Epoxides are also susceptible to anionic polymerization. And the idea here is that rather than having a cationic intermediate on the chain end with that electrophilic carbon being really the reactive point, we have an anion on the chain end, the O minus anion, that can add to another molecule of epoxide. So this happens repeatedly through repeated SN2 steps, creating O minus over and over and over again after this initiation by, for example, hydroxide to create that first O minus. And the result again is a polyether. And at some point, we're going to add protons to sort of neutralize the chain end and give the neutral polymer product here. So the hallmark of anionic polymerization, again, is an anion on the end of the chain. These are commonly living if that anion can hang around long enough to react with additional monomer if we add it at some later point in time. Now, electrophilic alkenes are actually ideal for anionic polymerization. And the reasons for this are essentially the reverse of the reasons that nucleophilic alkenes are best for cationic polymerizations. Electrophilic alkenes contain an electron withdrawing group linked to the CC double bond. So a sort of prototypical picture is here. We have our, our typical structure now for an electron withdrawing group, a double or triple bond involving two atoms where Y is more electronegative than X, making Y partially negative and X partially positive. And we can think about resonance forms of an alkene like this, where this carbon in particular picks up positive charge, showing that this carbon is particularly electrophilic. And the alkene overall is more electrophilic than an unsubstituted alkene like C2H4, ethylene. This has two effects. It makes the monomer itself more electrophilic, so more reactive with anions, more reactive with that anionic chain end. But it also stabilizes the anionic 
chain end, since the R group is positioned next to where that anion shows up as the chain grows. And this additional resonance form where we sort of push the negative charge into the electron withdrawing group leads to resonance stabilization and, and stabilization of the, the negative charge in the growing chain end. So this prevents, again, side reactions that would stop propagation, that would stop lengthening of the chain, perhaps before we want it to, or would prevent the polymerization from being living or, or something along these lines. So electrophilic alkenes are ideal for anionic polymerizations. They stabilize this negative charge on the growing chain end, and the neutral monomers are more reactive with that anionic chain end as well. Finally, we're just going to very briefly touch on radical polymerizations, which is a very important practical mode for polymerizing polymers today. Um, but we're just going to touch on it very briefly because the mechanisms can get a little bit complicated, and we don't touch too much on radicals in this course. So we're going to note it as a method of polymerization and look at a general mechanism and pretty much leave it there. Radical polymerizations are like cationic and anionic polymerizations. They're addition reactions, polyaddition reactions, but now the reactive chain end is a radical. And these are typically initiated by radical initiators and have mechanisms that are typical of radical chains. The initiation creates a radical species Rm dot propagation involves reaction of a neutral monomer molecule with Rm dot, that sort of initiated, that product of initiation, and the growing chain end always contains an unpaired electron. Termination can also occur, and of course termination can occur in the other two modes of polymerization as well, but I wanted to save some space and so left those out, but in the spirit of radical chains, if two chains find each other, they'll quite commonly couple to each other, and this can be a problematic or sometimes desirable way of terminating chain growth in radical polymerizations. Very, very typical for radical polymerizations is the pol polymerization of carbon-carbon double bonds, where this R is some kind of radical stabilizing group. I do want to actually back up though and talk about the typical initiators here. So the typical initi initiators are radical initiators that you may have seen previously in studies of radical reactions. Things with weak bonds like OO bonds or even halogens like I2 and Br2. So for example, uh, these uh, peroxides, these um, acyl oxy peroxides are common radical initiators since we get a radical when that relatively weak OO bond breaks. AIBN is a common radical initiator that can lose nitrogen, lose N2 to produce two radicals like this. And benzoans like this are also used as radical initiators. And here the mechanism gets a little bit complicated, but in the presence of an oxidant, for example, these can lose RH and give two um, acyl radicals like this to initiate polymerization. So. All of these initiators just kind of fall apart to produce radicals at the end of the day. And once that initiation event has occurred and we've added the initiator to the radical, well, now we're off to the races. We've got that radical electron that can add to one end of the alkene, typically the unsubstituted end, if this R group is some kind of radical stabilizing group, for example, a phenyl ring. And this addition leaves a radical on the growing chain end. So this happens over and over and over again. The chain lengthens, but we've always got a radical hanging out on the end of the chain. So these two can be living if that radical can hang around long enough, such that when we add more monomer at a later point in time, it's still there to consume or use up that monomer. So there's a lot more to the world of radical polymerizations than we can touch on here. But for the time being, we just want to note there's a general three-stage mechanism here with initiation and propagation, really the productive polymer forming steps. These are based on radical initiators that produce an unpaired electron. And on the growing chain end, we have a radical electron and radical repeated radical additions to the monomer are the hallmark of radical polymerizations.